Go ahead and take your seat. I want to uh, introduce you and thank you, worship team. Uh, you guys are in for a special treat today. Uh, I want to introduce you. We're going to have a guest speaker today, and um, this guy has a special place in my heart. Uh, first of all, I've known him for about 30 years, uh, which means I was negative seven when I met him, um, and he was like negative 10, right? Um, at this... Uh, Guy, his name is Mark Seagraves. Dr. Mark Seagraves is a man of God. I've known him all my life. Um, our fathers knew one another, and I think our grandfathers knew one another. Um, and uh, he is a gifted pastor uh, and a gifted leader. He was a church planter at one point, uh, has served as executive pastor, uh, and has done all kinds of things in ministry. Um, but the very special blessing with which God blessed him uh, was that he allowed him to marry my cousin, uh, Robin, Rome, uh, which was an act of, that was an act of God, Mark. You know that wasn't you, brother. Um, and I've asked, uh, I've asked Mark to come and preach to us today and bring the word of God. So would you guys welcome Dr. Mark Seagraves to come and preach for us this morning. Good morning. Amen. Thank you so much. Just look at somebody that, that's good looking next to you and just tell them that you're glad they're here this morning. Now you can turn to the other person beside you and apologize that you didn't pick them. <laughs> Man, so excited to be uh, with Pastor Brent and Rebecca and uh, this awesome uh, church family. Uh, and so honored to be sharing the last Sunday of 2018 with all of you. Man, what better way to end the year than looking at this? You know what I mean? Right? So Pastor Brent was talking about my wife, Robin. I'm so glad she could be here today. We actually just celebrated our 27th anniversary. That's right. And uh, kind of like Pastor Brent was saying, we got married when we were 12. Uh, not really. I'm as old as I look, but um, we also uh, today uh, are privileged to have our amazingly talented and beautiful daughter, Christiana, here. Could, could you just stand up real quick? She, she does not want me to do this. That's Christiana right there. She is 20 years old, and she is currently single. And uh, her, her number is 1-800-ASK-MY-DAD. You want to talk to her, you talk to me. All right. But, uh, we've had such a great time uh, the last few days hanging out with uh, family. Uh, let me just ask a quick question, just some authenticity, some transparency here at the end of the year. How many of you would say over the last week or two you've eaten too much? Thank you, thank you. I, I, pre I appreciate the authenticity here. We do have a class for liars, though, afterwards, because I saw some of you did not uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'm putting both hands up if I, if I can because, uh, I mean, if you'd seen me a week ago, uh, just one week ago, uh, you would think that Pastor Brent and I were twins. I'm, I'm serious. We, we looked very, very similar, but now, you know, this is, this is what it is. I will, I will tell you this, though. Uh, I have actually lost 60 pounds this year. 60 pounds, yeah. So uh, I'm excited about that. But here I am facing a new year now. And uh, that was a great accomplishment, but I've got uh, some new goals because I I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep on going and uh, new opportunities and new challenges. And so I, I find myself asking this question here at the end of the year after all of that, now what? Now what? Uh, I, I know that uh, Pastor Brent has been uh, preaching this series lately uh, called Wait For It. And... Uh, one of the things that we were waiting for all of those years was for Jesus to show up in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and he finally showed up. And afterwards, that same question uh, needed to be asked. Now what? How do we, how do we move forward into the next uh, season? Uh, how do we reach out for whatever it is that God has for us? And so I want to encourage you this morning, uh, before you go out and start all kinds of drastic diet plans in the new year, before you go out and sign up for a gym membership, that you're going to stop using within six or seven weeks. Somebody said amen to that. <laughs> Done that 19 times. Uh, let me just talk to you about that for a moment. Now what? And I'm going to talk about discovering God's power for 
uh, moving forward in your life. So this is going to be the shortest message you have ever heard. Uh, not in time necessarily, although I will try to be cognizant of the time. But I'm just I'm going to preach one sentence to you, if that's okay, and uh, share that. And it's based on three theological concepts, which we'll touch on. Uh, but one sentence that can answer that question: Now what? Uh, and help us discover God's power to move forward in our life. So uh, let me just begin this way: Wouldn't it be nice to know what the most important verse or scripture in the entire Bible really is? I mean, the Bible's a big book, right? So what, what is the most important scripture? I, I'm sure all of us, if we were to get together in a group and just talk about it, we'd probably come up with a lot of different uh, verses that we might think were, were the best. I mean, Psalm 23, I mean, come on, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff, right? Or Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says, I know the plans that I have for you, right? Man, this is, this is good stuff. Or what about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That is good. But fortunately, you're not left asking this question very long because Jesus actually answered it for us. He was, he was asked that question. What is the most important scripture or the most important command uh, in the Bible? And Jesus responded this way, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 37. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and the greatest commandment. This is it. He identifies the most important scripture, and what it boils down to, down to is have an awesome relationship with God. That's it. That God really wants to have a relationship with you, that he is not some distant deity from another dimension kind of relationship, but this is a close, intimate relationship that flows from every part of who he is to every part of who you are. Out of all the scriptures, that's the most important. Love God, be in relationship with God. But here's, here's the problem. The question is, how can we love God or have an intimate relationship with God especially if we cannot really know him as he is or approach him. How do, you, how do you have an intimate relationship with anyone that you don't know? Because good relationships are built on good communication. Good relationships are built on learning more and more about the other person. If, if you want to have an intimate relationship with God, you've got to learn more and more about him. In fact, this was Paul's prayer for the, the church at Colossae in Colossians 1 verse 10. He says that you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. The Amplified Bible actually says it this way, with fuller, deeper, and clearer insight, acquaintance, and recognition. So Paul makes it obvious here that knowing God really is possible. And when he says better and better, that means that it's progressive. In other words, we can know him more tomorrow than we know him today. But when you think about it, after all, when it comes to knowing God, isn't that a little bit like an ant trying to understand the overwhelming nature of the universe? He, he's so, so far above us. And so let me, let me just give you you're wondering what that one sentence is. Like, that's a lot of sentences. You're only going to preach one sentence. Let me give you the first part of this sentence that I'm going to share with you, and you can fill in the blanks as you go through if you've got your notes. Uh, but the first part of the sentence is this. God is beyond us. Let's write that down. God is beyond us. There's a theological concept here called transcendent, that uh, transcendence, that God is transcendent, that he is above, that he is beyond us. Uh, so let me explain what I mean. Here, here's what Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24. He says, God is spirit. God is spirit. Now, you, you might find that some translations, depending on what you're reading, might say God is a Spirit, But actually, in the Greek language behind John 4, 24, there is no indefinite article there. It, it literally can be translated and should be translated, God is spirit. Well, spirit, that, that's something that we have a hard time comprehending. We, we hear the word spirit, and our imagination right begins to run wild. Like, what, what are you talking about, spirit? Like, I hear the word ghost when you say, when you say spirit. And so I have, a, I have a hard time with that concept because we think in terms of what we can comprehend with our senses, you know, what, what I can feel or what I can see or what I can hear or taste or, or even smell. But the Bible tells us that God is beyond us. 
So I want you to think about just for a second that in this, in this atmosphere, there's actually a lot of things happening in this atmosphere right now. If we had the right receptors, we could actually see probably radio waves flying through the air right here and probably some television signals flying through the air. We're not built to receive them, but they're in the air. But also in the air around us is moisture. There's water in the air, H2O. Water molecules are filling the air, but we, we really can't see them, and they are beyond our comprehension in terms of uh, being able able to sense them with those five senses unless it's really humid. I've been here long enough to know that St. Louis, I was born here, St. Louis can get humid, right? So you can sense it then. But normally, you really can't grasp the fact that there is water and moisture all around us. We, we don't have the capacity to gather it in. We, don't, we can't just reach out and grab it. It's, it's just not available to our senses. And God is like that. He's beyond our senses. Even though he's here and he's everywhere, he is transcendent beyond us. So Jesus went on to say in John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. Here's here's another one, 1 Timothy 1, 17. I'm going to fly through a bunch of scriptures here. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So this is from our perspective. God is spirit. He is invisible. He is intangible. He is eternal. He is incomprehensible. So I love this. I love this verse, a couple of verses from Job, Job 36, 26 in the Old Testament says, behold, God is great and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. And then Job 11, 7 through 10, I'm going to read this from the message paraphrase, says, do you think you can explain the mystery of God? Do you think you can diagram God Almighty? God is far higher than you can imagine, far deeper than you can comprehend, stretching farther than earth's horizons, far wider than the endless ocean. So God is above and beyond the tangible universe. So far beyond us in size and power and perfection. This is 1 Timothy 6.16. It says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. There's a couple of verses in the Old Testament and some that are repeated in the New that actually describe God in a very interesting way. One in Deuteronomy 4 says, The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 5.25, now therefore why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. That was their perspective of it, but the point is that they understood God is beyond us. So let me ask you that question. Why is he so unapproachable in this concept called transcendence? It has to do with the fact that he is righteous, that he is holy, that he is perfect. You think about the water and the air that surrounds us and how, how pure that is. If you're in the right place and the water comes down, you can drink rainwater. But if there's been pollution and it goes to a certain extent, that water that's in the air can actually become so polluted that it produces what's called acid rain. It can actually cause destruction on the earth. So God is this pure, holy, righteous God and introducing anything else to him, in him, would make him something that he is not. So this is a problem because, as Pastor Brent said, we're all broken. We're all, we're all messed up. We, we've got issues. I, in fact, we could have a contest today because I, I know I got more issues than you got. I got issues. Man. I'll confess that. Thank you, Pastor Brent. He's like, hey, man, that's good, that's good. I've observed that. <laughs> so here's the problem. If, if the only way to know God is to be as perfect as he is and righteous as he is, then we have no hope because no one can claim those particular attributes. We're sinners by birth. We're sinners by behavior. And there's nothing that we could do about our condition. That There's no way for us to perfect ourselves. How many of you have been able to get on a diet and stick to it? Yeah. Yeah. I saw one hand who <laughs> was kind of timid, you know, like, well, yeah, wait till tomorrow. <laughs> no, good luck, good luck. So that's what I meant to say. But there's really nothing that we can do about our condition through our own willpower. And so God, who is also perfect in love, put into motion a plan 
that really has been in existence since before the world began. So let me give you the next part of our sentence. God is beyond us, but he came to us. Write that down. God is beyond us, but he came to us. This is really what we've been celebrating this whole season, the last several weeks. Isaiah 7, 14 says, all right, then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Look at this description of the coming Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Somehow, God is going to make himself self accessible to us. And this is what happened. This is from Matthew chapter 1. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, And it says this, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled what was spoken of the Lord by the prophet that we just read, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God is beyond us, but he came to us. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We, We can't comprehend this, that God was somehow manifested in flesh and justified in the spirit and seen by angels and preached among the Gentiles and believed on in the world and then received up into glory. He's talking about Jesus here. That's amazing that the transcendent, invisible God became visible. And that's a second theological concept that we're familiar with because of Christmas, and that's called the incarnation. He was transcendent, but he became incarnate. Listen to this. I I love this. Colossians 1, 13 through 15. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Watch this. Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. So somehow, in the person of Jesus Christ, the God who is beyond us came to us. Imagine that, the infinite, eternal, incomprehensible, suddenly wearing a robe and sandals. The one who was never hungry experienced hunger. He never grew tired, and yet now he knows what physical exhaustion is like. The Bible says that he never slept But now he often falls into a deep sleep. This one who could never be tempted was tempted in all points like as we are. The one who is eternal subjected himself to death. And he lived in every way through this humanity just like we do to the point of praying, to the point even of being baptized. Anything an an ordinary man should do, he did. So think about that. God is beyond us, beyond our senses, but watch this description of him in the incarnation. 1 John chapter 1, from the very first day we were right there taking, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears. We, we saw it with our own eyes. We verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this, the infinite Life of God himself took shape before us. Now tangible, ears, eyes, hands, tangible. The God beyond us came to us. So let me get back to the water. There's still water everywhere in the atmosphere. But somehow, I'm using this for two reasons. Good illustration, and I'm thirsty. The God who beyond, who is beyond us came to us. Now all of a sudden, there's this manifestation of the water that has come to us in concentrated form. And the interesting thing about this, even at 9.30 in the morning on a Sunday, trying to wrap my head around this a little bit, is that all of that water in the universe and all of the water that's now concentrated in this bottle does not reduce the amount of water anywhere. He is still everywhere. 
Isn't that amazing? And yet now, he is tangible. I can, I can hold this. I can touch this within my grasp. Somehow, in some mysterious way, this unknowable and unreachable has become accessible to us in tangible form. God who is beyond us, but he came to us. But let me ask you, what is the purpose of that? How does this help us as we're moving forward into the next season, as I'm trying to embrace new opportunities, new possibilities, new challenges, as, as, I'm, as I'm setting new goals? How do I tap into what God has for me? What is God thinking? I want you to watch what God did for us. Romans 3 says, The Scripture tells us that no one is acceptable to God. Not one of them understands or even searches for God. They have all turned away and are worthless. There isn't one that does right. Ecclesiastes kind of repeats that idea and says there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. So that's the problem. We're just not good enough. God's beyond us. We can't approach him. And so God decided in one a magnificent miracle to switch places with us through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man comes unto the Father but by me. I can't tell you how many people I have observed in my life trying to get to God and however they view God in all kinds of ways and usually those ways involve a lot of straining and trying and self-effort and it's all about I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get my ducks in a row, man. I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some, some commitments and I'm never gonna mess up again. You watch me. You watch me. I'm gonna be so good that God's proud of me and wants to have a relationship with me not even realizing that we are totally incapable of accomplishing that. And God is fully aware of that. And so he did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. He said, if you will come through me, you can have free and open access. Jesus did something through his life, through that death and that burial and that resurrection, and if we will accept what he did, we actually become uniquely qualified for something that God has planned from the beginning. So let me finish the sentence. That means I'm almost done. You can go to breakfast. God is beyond us, but he came to us so he could live in us. This is a theological concept that we call eminence. There's several different ways that you can actually spell the word eminence. But this particular way, I-M-M-A, is a theological concept that has to do with the fact that God is near and he is pervading his creation. In other words, what God really wants beyond all things, remember man was like the crowning achievement, and by that I mean man and woman. <laughs> it's the crowning, thank you, she said, was the crowning achievement of God's creation, and God did not want to exist apart from that creation, but to live within that creation. And so listen to what Jesus says in describing the Holy Spirit. John 14 and verse 17, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. God is spirit, but the spirit of the God who is beyond us can live inside of us because of what Jesus has done for us us. This is one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture. This is Galatians 3 and verse 14. It says, through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham. If, I won't go into that story, but basically what happened for Abraham is that because he trusted God, instead of trying to figure it out on his own, instead of trying to do it on his own, instead of trying to be, you know, the he-man in the situation and try to do it all himself, he simply believed God. And when he trusted God, God, God said, I'm going to give you a gift you don't even deserve. I'm going to declare you to be absolutely right with me. In God's eyes, Abraham became perfect. He became holy. He became righteous simply because he believed God. That is the blessing of Abraham. 
but I want to show you what the blessing of Abraham makes us eligible for. Watch the language of Galatians 3 and verse 14. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, being declared right with God, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. That's what happens when you accept what Jesus has done. It makes you eligible for the power and presence of God to live fully in your life. As broken as each of us is, that has always been God's desire. You go back to the Old Testament and listen to this description, Ezekiel 36, 26. God says, I want to give you a new heart. I want to put a new spirit in you. I want to take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. In other words, I want to take out that heart that requires rules and, and rigid, rigid regulations. And, and I, want to put, I want to put a living presence on the inside of you. In fact, it, the next verse says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You know what that means? It means I'm going to give you the power to do what I want in your life. I'm going to give you, not you, you don't have to measure up, you don't have to try to do this in your own strength, I'm going to empower you to do that. Now, I have a health coach because I found out that I can't lose weight just on my own. So I've got a coach, Sharon, he's in Phoenix. Great guy. And he gives me, he calls me all the time, he texts me all the time, he gives me great insight all the time, he actually hooks me up with product, this particular product, and I'm eating things that basically are all made of alfalfa, God help me. It's like soybean bars and soybean cereal and soybean. Oh, I'll be all right. But the one thing that he cannot do is he cannot give me the desire or the will or the power to live that life. And God says, here's what's going to happen with the Holy Spirit in your life. Life is not going to be about external rules or human willpower. It's going to be about a presence and a power that is living within you. This is relationship at a different level because he says in the very next verse, you will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people and I will be your God. There's something about opening up to the presence of God in your life that just makes this relationship so much more intimate. And so here was the prophecy. This is one of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. He says, then after all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Verse 29 says, and in those days I will pour out my spirits even on servants, men and women alike. Basically, he's saying this is going to be universally available to anyone who wants it. So theologically, we might say it like this. God is transcendent, but he became incarnate so that he could be imminent. That doesn't, that doesn't help a whole lot of people. So let's say it this way. God is beyond us, but he came to us so he could live in us. So maybe you're sitting here today and you're wondering, what's next? How do I, how do I move forward into this next season with the power of God in my life? I'm going to give you the secret that Jesus shared in Luke 11 and verse 13. It says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You just ask, and he comes. I like Ephesians 5.18. It says, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, don't drink that. Drink this, this God who is beyond us but came to us. give it to you from the message Ephesians 5.18 don't drink too much wine that cheapens your life drink the spirit of God huge draughts of him and here's why here's why you want to do this because Acts 1.8 says 
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Something happens when the power and presence of God is invited into your life. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is a comforter. It's going to teach you. It's going to help you remember. But it's going to give you power to move forward into the next season of your life. Would you stand with me real quickly? I want to pray with you. And here's what I, here's what I want to do. I just want to end this service really by doing what Jesus said to do. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And here's what I want to encourage you to do. We're going to, we're going to just ask the Lord to fill us right now. But I noticed in reading the early church history all throughout the book of Acts that the early church people were filled over and over and over again. So I want to encourage you as you're moving forward into this next year, we're going to pray it right now, but see, this is a prayer that you can pray tomorrow. And this is a prayer you can pray on January the 1st when all those New Year's resolutions have been put on paper. And you can say, God, look at all these resolutions I'm making. You know I'm not going to keep them, so how about just filling me with the Holy Spirit a little bit, right? So can we do that just to, to close out this service? I want you just in your own way, just in this moment, close your eyes for just a moment. And make yourself just as spiritually receptive as you can and just pray that prayer that Jesus said to pray, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Would you just do that right now? I'm going to do that with you. Father, thank you for making yourself accessible to us. Thank you, Lord, that even though you were so far beyond us and there was no way that we could reach you, that that chasm was too far, too wide, too deep, and there was no way, and yet you came to us. You became accessible to us, God. You walked among us. You, you experienced what we experienced. You, you know where we are and what we're going through, God. But the reason you came was so that the relationship could go even deeper and you could live within us. And so, Father, we ask you right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, fill us. Fill us to overflowing with your spirit, God. We make a commitment from this point. We are going to drink deeply, drink deeply, drink deeply every day of who you are. When I'm in the dark moments, God, I'm going to say, fill me. When I'm doing great, I'm going to say, fill me. When I'm facing new challenges, I'm going to say, fill me. Because I can't live this life without your power and presence. And I know that as I do this every day, that you are going to help me to move forward in this next season. In Jesus' mighty name. Would you just give God some thanks and some praise for that? In Jesus' name.